we do have Nila C uh, Sumac here, so we can get started. Um, I'm not moderating this panel. I am introducing it, but sort of want to speak to the origins of this panel and how this came to be. Um, it did come from a Genocide Awareness Week uh, Community Advisory Board meeting, and Nira and I were, you know, talking a little bit, and we decided, you know, something should, you know, we're doing the academic stuff here. We've got plenty of academics. We just had a screening of a film. We're going to have another one tomorrow. We've had performers, but we don't have the people, we didn't have anything for the people who actually do the work on the ground like Naomi Steinberg here, who Olina will uh, introduce here momentarily, the people who are doing the work on the ground, resettling refugees, the people who welcome people who are often not welcomed the way they should be into this country and into our communities. And, you know, so it's one thing to give our papers about it, but the daily work that they do and the way shifts in policies affect their jobs and... Um, this is an important perspective. It uh, can't always be, you know, the academic perspectives on these things. And, and obviously, um, we decided to look at genocides, refugees, and diasporas for this conference. And why? Well, um, again, Nira and I were talking about this, that, uh, you know, with destruction, with genocide, groups get targeted, the removal from traditional lands and homes, degenerative warfare that, you know, target civilians. And according to the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, there were 89.3 million uh, forcibly displaced people worldwide at the end of 2021. Among those, 27.1 were refugees, half of those under the age of 18. Um, and when we talk about the 89.3 million, you know, that's more than double the, of the 42.7 million after World War II, right? Like, we have a true refugee crisis. These numbers are beyond what we had after the Second World War. Um, furthermore, uh, you know, there are, were 53.2 million internally displaced people, 4.6 million asylum seekers, 4.4 uh, million Venezuelans displaced, and according to Amnesty International in 2019, more than two-thirds of all refugees came from five countries, Syria, Venezuela, Af Afghanistan, South Sudan, which is in the news again this week, and Myanmar, which we heard Wei Wei New talk about. So there is obviously a relationship between correlation, cause and effect, between genocide and refugees, Syria's been the main country of origin for refugees since 2014. And at the end of 2019, there were 6.6 .6 million Syrian refugees hosted by 126 countries. And to moderate this panel, we've invited Olena Tanchuk, a Fulbright visiting scholar um, at the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College here at ASU. And um, Olena's gonna share her story because with Ukraine, we have 5.9 million internally displaced Ukrainians, 8 million Ukrainians in neighboring countries and across Europe, and 17.6 million Ukrainians in need of humanitarian assistance. So I'm going to button it and pass it off uh, to Alina to uh, introduce our, um, our panel. Um, and uh, Olina will be moderating and also uh, sharing her story as well and kind of being part of this conversation um, in a way that I wouldn't have been as a moderator. So here you go, Lena, and we look forward to your panel. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome you all today to our panel. And um, it's my first experience. Uh, moreover, it's the first time I met Tim today in person. So a lot of firsts. But I hope that in this friendly environment, we will support each other. And um, I shouldn't be worrying, right? <laughs> OK, so thank you. So um, I will use my notes, not because I don't know what to say and I need to follow the script of the show, but just because uh, I have so many things always to say. And as a linguist, I'm always, you know, can uh, meander somewhere and my mind can wandering around. So I will try to stick to my notes. So excuse me for that. 
So um, again, welcome all to our official start. And as we gather here today, we are reminded of the many challenges that refugees face today around the world. And uh, so many people have been forced to flee their countries, their hometowns, and millions of people have been uprooted from their homes. And for many of them, resettlement is the only hope for survival and the only hope to start new life and to continue live and enjoy their futures. Uh, today's panel discussion is timely and critical conversation. Uh, there are so many things, so many worries, uh, conflicts are going on around the world. And um, we have with us today a distinguished group of speakers, experts, who will share their experience and uh, um, they will bring their challenges, their perspectives and their opportunities on this topic. And what makes this panel even more special that all of us, so three ladies that you can see um, in this room today and virtually, so we all have a lot uh, and uh, um, just to say and share, and there is a lot that we can bring to this panel, uh, sharing our personal stories as well. And uh, for me, um, I'm a Fulbright Scholar at Mary Fulton Teachers College, but my program actually ended in May, and my husband and I, we were supposed to come back to Ukraine, and um, our plans um, unexpectedly changed. I'm so lucky that I here with my husband because he uh, previously was involved in military, so and we understand that the first thing that um, local government would do to him uh, on February 21st, 2022, uh, to, uh, yeah, 2022, so um, he would be sent to military, he would be sent to hot zones, and he would fight for the independence of um, our city and the independence of our country. Um, but luckily we are here helping and supporting our country daily, volunteering online, donating, and um, doing our best to support uh, um, our people and our country. Um, yeah, and as I have already mentioned, I'm here not only because I'm staying here a little bit longer than I planned, not only because I fell in love with beautiful Arizona and um, such friendly people who live here, but just because I was forced to stay um, as I am from the eastern part of Ukraine and uh, I don't have uh, many options now as I'm originally from Mariupol. Probably you have heard it from the news a lot recently. And um, um, now the city is under Russian occupation and uh, my um, students, my colleagues, my uh, family, some of them had f um, flee, uh, flee the, uh, the city and the place, some of them had to stay because um, some different circumstances, but the situation is difficult for the country and uh, uh, the topic that uh, we discuss today is not something that I read from the books or not something that I know from videos or from YouTube, uh, this is something that I experience every day. Um, back in 2014, I had to flee my uh, another or my first maybe hometown, which is Donetsk. Probably you also know about that. So I um, in 2014, I received the status of IDP, which is internally displaced person. Um, and in 2022, thanks to uh, Russian president, I received uh, this status again. Now I call myself again IDP, but this time internationally displaced person. So I'm again an IDP. But um, uh, we still are fighting daily and we uh, are not going to give up. And um, uh, we believe uh, in our victory and we don't believe that um, our country will give up and um, we understand that evil should be um, fought, right? And back to our panelists. I'm sorry if I was a little bit longer than expected, so that's why I use my notes. So back to our panelists. Our experts have lived through the struggles and challenges of resettlement firsthand, and today bring a unique perspective perspective to this discussion as well. And through their contributions, we hope to gain a deeper understanding of the issues of genocide, of uh, refugee resettlement and challenges of resettlements and the importance of the role of local communities and the support of those people 
uh, who welcome refugees uh, on um, on the new places. And we look forward to stimulating and informative discussion and hope that it will inspire all of us to take some actions. So let me introduce our first uh, um, panelist. Um, actually, I don't know who would like to be the first, <laughs> okay? So uh, maybe we can... Okay, so good. So um, I would like to introduce my um, uh, to introduce our first uh, panelist, Naomi Steinberg. And excuse me if I pronounce their <laughs> name and surname uh, in my Ukrainian way. Um, so Naomi joined the Hebrew uh, Immigrant Aid Society as vice president policy and advocacy in September 2017. Previously, Naomi was the director of Refugee Council USA, a coalition dedicated to refugee protection, uh, welcome and excellence in the U.S. refugee resettlement program. In this position, she led the overall work of the Council, including facilitating partnerships between Refugee Council and other non-governmental organizations, as well as fostering strong communications between international, federal, and state partners. Prior to her work with um, Refugee Center, Naomi was the deputy director of the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center. Uh, and this center, she focused on building the capacity of community-based refugee-led organizations. Naomi has a master's degree in Southeast Asian Studies from Cornell University and her bachelor's degree in political science from McAllister College. So please, Naomi, it's over to you. I'm gotcha, gotcha. Can you hear me now? I feel like I'm in a cell phone commercial, but okay. Um, I, <laughs> it is it is on. Okay. No, it's a little bit weird. Can really you? Oh, oh, this yeah. is this is working. Okay. Um, it is a real honor for me to be here at ASU today. This is not my first time. When I was tenish years old, my family came to the Fiesta Bowl as. Penn State fans, and so um, it's been a few decades, but it is it is good to be back. Um, as was mentioned, I am the Vice President for U.S. Policy and Advocacy at HIAS. We primarily, my team primarily focuses on two buckets of advocacy, if you will, the U.S. Asylum System and the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program, which is more of what I'll be discussing today. I've been at HIAS for almost six years now, and prior to that, as was mentioned, I was the director of Refugee Council USA. But it's interesting to me how full circle this is because I got interested in refugee work because of one encounter with one person. Um, and it started me on my path to being interested in Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, and refugees from that part of the world. After my sophomore year in high school, I went to a global leadership camp for young people, and I met a girl my age who was a resettled refugee from Cambodia, and she talked about her experience, and I will never forget, she told me about her sister, who she saw tied up to a tree and left there to die with nothing but insects crawling all over her body. So that was the summer after my sophomore year. And when you have a conversation like that, it really, it really sticks with you. I, I often think like if I had worked at Dairy Queen that summer, what would I be doing now? I don't know, but it really sent me on a path. And it led me to multiple times in Southeast Asia studying and multiple times intersecting with refugee issues. And after 23 years in the refugee field, I'm so honored to be at HIAS. Um, and I always love to talk about our work, but today is particularly special for me because I became particularly interested in the connections between contemporary genocide and refugee protection because of the role that resettlement can play as part of the international response. I started to become interested when I started to learn more about and to do advocacy on Rohingya issues, Rohingya, the Rohingya refugee crisis. And I know that many of you heard Weiwei speak yesterday. I mean, she's the best of the best. But I got interested because of what was happening in Burma and what was happening in Bangladesh. And I brought that interest and I brought that background with me to HIAS, which is a natural place for this kind of work to deepen. 
And I, I'm especially grateful to my colleagues at HIAS for, for supporting me and bringing this, this unique interest with me. Um, and so I want to start by sharing a few words about what HIAS is today. I suspect that some of you in the room know the HIAS of yore, but we have changed a lot. So today we are the International Jewish Humanitarian Organization that provides vital services to refugees and other displaced people in 23 countries. I think a lot of people think we are just a US-based organization, but we're in 23 countries and growing. Our clients that we serve come from all faiths, diverse ethnicities and backgrounds and nationalities. We advocate for the rights of forcibly displaced people around the world to be able to create a home where they are safe and they can live dignified, li dignified lives with safety and welcome. And we provide legal support, we provide economic integration support, and we provide support for survivors of gender-based violence, and we are also specialized in providing psychosocial support. So we've grown a great deal from when we first started so many years ago on New York's Lower East Side. Here in the United States, we are one of the nine national refugee resettlement agencies, which means that we partner with the State Department. And I know tomorrow evening, the Assistant Secretary for the refugee part of the State Department will be speaking. But we work with the State Department to resettle refugees here in this country. And we do so with a network of local organizations all over. We actually have a partner organization in Tucson, so not, not too far. So we've got our footprint here in Arizona as well. The slightly longer version about HIAS, though, is that we work to achieve protection for refugees, doing so from a deep place, a deep grounding in our Jewish values, history, text, and experience. We are, in fact, the world's oldest refugee organization, refugee serving organization. We were originally established as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society in the early 1900s continuing the work of several predecessor organizations that had worked in the 1880s and the 1890s to serve Jewish refugees who were fleeing pogroms in Russia and Eastern Europe. And then our work evolved to serve Jews fleeing from other parts of the world. And of course, we played a significant role um, following World War II, um, helping to resettle Jews who had survived the Holocaust. But we've also served Jews fleeing from the former Soviet Union, from Iran, from Egypt, from Cuba. The list goes on and on. Now, though, while we were originally set up by Jews helping Jews, as I said, we serve refugees and other forcibly displaced people from all over the place. We have thousands of employees. We are on multi-continents. I think if people from the Lower East Side saw us today, you know, from the 1900s, they wouldn't necessarily recognize us. What we like to say is we used to help refugees because they were Jewish. Now we help refugees because we are Jewish. It is really rooted in who we are and in our texts and guided by our shared Jewish histories and ethics. Um, and I think I think that I might have gone on too long just about who Hyas is, but I, when it comes back around to talk a little bit about the role resettlement plays. I also want to talk a little bit about how it's not just Hyas that really continued to do our work after the Holocaust, but also the very parameters of the refugee protection system came directly out of the ashes of the Holocaust. So I'll talk a little bit about that when, when it comes back around to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. So really, um, the work of refugee resettlement programs offer hope and new beginning for those who need this help, who need this support. And what you do is an amazing job. And of course, without you, a lot of people would probably um, not be able to understand what they need to do in the future. And you really give hope to those refugees. So our next uh, speaker, uh, let me introduce um, a wonderful Neira Sumik. Again, I'm sorry if I mispronounce the name and last name. So who joins us virtually today? So Neira Sumik is a former refugee who was forced to flee from her home country of Bosnia and Herzegovina. After surviving through a civil war, Neira and her family were granted asylum as refugees in the United States. Neira received her master's in public administration at Western International University 
and is the co-author of Divine Love. In her current role, she is the national field manager of the We Are All America campaign and the Arizona delegate for Refugee Congress, where she helps advocate for refugees and asylum seekers. Nera sits on various national and local boards and is part of the She Leads Mentorship Program, where she mentors other women. She is most passionate about human rights because everyone deserves the right to seek safety and refuge. So, Nera, please, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Elena. It's really an honor for me to be here. You see, I really do consider myself to be one of the lucky ones today um, because there are so many people around the world that are not so fortunate that to have made it or to be able to uh, resettle to a third country like the United States. I know Tim was sharing a couple of statistics at the beginning, but um, I want to provide a few more updated statistics from more recent of 2022, but less than 1% of people are resettled like me to a country like the United States. And so according to those statistics, the number of forcibly displaced people around the world has really gone up. In 2022, it was reported over 100 million people are forcibly displaced. And out of those 100 million people, over 26 million are deemed as refugees. For refugees, there is a specific definition. They must cross an international border. And most of those are majority uh, uh, women and children. Also, the correlation of people who are displaced and genocide, um, it's a clear cor correlation. If, you, if there's genocide happening in your country, you're going to be displaced. And during this time that we're seeing um, the largest number of people that are globally displaced, we are seeing a lot of countries shutting their doors and closing borders, including Western countries who have the resources and the capacity to welcome them. Now, I can speak from personal experience and say, nobody wants to leave their home. I don't know how many people are in this room that are from refugee or immigrant backgrounds, but nobody wants to leave their home. My family and I did not want to leave our home. My country is located in Eastern Europe. Um, and on April 5th, 1992, I'm sure many of you have heard back what was happening in, in Yugoslavia, but the government of Bosnia declared its independence from now what's known as former Yugoslavia. And they wanted to create an independent Bosnian nation that would have Bosniak Muslim majorities. That was opposed by Bosnian Serbs at the time who launched a military campaign to take over our, our land and ethnically cleanse um, Muslim civilian population. The atrocities that I witnessed in my community were really gruesome. We saw the creation of camps, um, concentration camps, rape camps, where a lot of our family members were taken. We saw cities and villages that were burned down. We saw families that were systematically separated and taken to these camps. We saw systemic torturing and killing of Bosnian Muslims whose bodies were then placed in hidden mass graves that are being uncovered till this day or thrown down Bosnia's uh, national rivers. One example I can provide is on July 11th, which is a very important date for us. In July 11, 1995, um, the uh, genocide in the town of Srebrenica, which is a a uh, town in Eastern Bosnia um, occurred. This was supposed to be a safe area designated uh, by the United Nations peacekeepers who were safeguarding it. But instead they handed over 8,000 Muslim men and boys to the aggressors who systematically executed them in the two day period. I wear this Pendant today because surrounding the green coffins are the mothers who are wearing white and mourning their loved ones. And the petals represent the day the genocide happened. 
while their color represents the innocence of the victims. And this pennant for me represents the hope and justice and recognition of, of, of the genocide that happened. During this subsequent war, over 100,000 people in my country, innocent people were, were killed and 80% of those were Bosnian Muslims. Now, going back to my personal story, I remember the morning my dad was taken. He was taken not because he of any wrongdoing or because he committed a crime, but simply because he carried a Muslim name. My mom and I ended up having to flee our home and we traveled through a very dangerous journey to cross into the bordering country of Croatia. Eventually, over a year, we were finally able to be reunited with my father. And it was through the, through thanks through a British uh, journalist who uncovered the concentration camps and brought to a global spotlight what was happening. And that's when the camps were shut down. Till this day, my father's perpetrators, they walk free on the streets of Bosnia. We've seen them when we go back and visit and no justice has been served for him. During our time in Croatia, we applied for asylum um, and we were sent to live in Spain where we lived in refugee camps there that were set up for us. After um, waiting almost three years, we eventually resettled into the United States. Um, so that's one thing that's very common is for refugees to travel through multiple countries and wait in refugee camps for a long period of time. In fact, the average time for a, a individual in a refugee camp is 10 years. So can you imagine there are children who are born and even raised in camps and never live outside of a refugee tent? For us in particular, the resettlement process was difficult um, and the integration process was difficult. Uh, after arrival, we were on our own after three months. We had to start paying back our plane tickets within six months of arrival. I know people think that refugees just come here for free, but there is a cost to it and it is expensive. Um, my parents also had to take on the first jobs that they were offered. Um, these jobs were with minimum wage at a factory where oftentimes their worker rights were violated. We also oftentimes faced discrimination because we didn't speak the language and because we were refugees. But my, my parents continued to strive for a better life for, for me and my sister, and they were determined to start a new life here no matter how hard it was. They became homeowners after three years of arriving in the US. I look back now as an adult, I have no idea how they managed to do that working minimum wage jobs. Um, but I will say for me, the impact I had growing up was, um, I did not feel like I could fit into the American um, system, the American schools or the society. I was often bullied and could not, and other children could not relate to me because of the traumatic experience I had, they had no idea what, you know, living through something like that is like. But academics went very went well for me. I went on and got my bachelor's at ASU, go Sun Devils. Um, I also went and got my, uh, my master's degree. And I really became passionate around grassroots organizing, social justice work, advocacy. Um, and and at first this time this year, first time I published my first co-author book, which I'm really really excited um, to have published. But I will say till this day, like there are what I experience has left a long-term impact on me. And even back home, um, which we were able to reclaim our our home, our property, and we go back and visit, but we are still seeing the impact and aftermath of genocide. Particularly, genocide denial has really hindered the country and my people from being able to move forward. Um, and that from an economic and collective, uh, from a collective perspective as people has held us back. We still have the same so-called leaders who are creating divisiveness and not unity among the people. 
And I truly believe until the truth is actually acknowledged and recognized and until new leaders who are there for the people step in, my country will not be able to move forward. So I just want to conclude because I want to be mindful of time, but the message I want to send is we must hold these perpetrators accountable and create a better due process, whether that's through, through the international tribunal courts. And we have to also create an authentic space for testimony for survivors of genocide and people who are forcibly displaced and engaging them in, in advocacy and their testimony. Lastly, we all collectively have a, an obligation as a global community to speak up against these atrocities that are happening. And these are not atrocities that are happening a thing in the past, but are happening now as we speak, as, as Elena shared what is happening currently in her country. Thank you, back to you, Elena. Thank, thank you, Naira. And my, my voice is trembling now because every word, every sentence, every story that you shared resonates and mirrors uh, with my experience. And what is happening now in Ukraine, it's absolutely the same pattern that happened in your country in 90s. And I don't know why we are all human beings, right? So we all have brain, but why don't we learn from lessons? Why don't we repeat the history again? And um, we have in 2022 uh, exactly the same pattern of behavior of Russia that aggressively invades Ukraine. And um, I, I'm also today wearing my pin. It's Ukrainian flag. So I think we all, um, people who, um, suffer and who live through this experience, we appreciate that and we want to uh, wear at least something what is dear to us, a piece of our country with us and I think it will be forever in our hearts and we feel it we, uh, better when we have something with us. So that's why I think that we must recognize the resilience and strengths of all refugees and help them to uh, not only survive but we have to support them. And as local communities here in Arizona, we all already have our Ukrainian, Amer American Ukrainian, Ukrainian American community um, that uh, help us a lot. And we have also Ukrainian refugees who uh, come to Arizona. Uh, the thing is that uh, it's a little bit um, a complicated case for Ukrainians because a lot of people from Ukraine who come here um, to Arizona or any other state or to Europe, um, sometimes we can't be considered as refugees or asylum seekers because officially the situation in Ukraine is not called genocide. Still, there is no evidence, there are, uh, I mean, there is no documented uh, uh, protocol that would uh, officially state that what is happening in my country now, that it is genocide. This is something that we are fighting for. Uh, we are advocating for our country, for our rights, and we want international community to recognize it and officially coin it that uh, it is a genocide against Ukrainian uh, community, against Ukrainian nation, and it will um, help us a lot, not only to like morally understand that uh, uh, it's our small victory, uh, but it will also help us uh, um, legally to proceed to some, pro to some processes. So thank you, thank you, our panelists. And I have some questions to you, and uh, um, I will uh, first speak to Naomi, okay? And Naomi, so my question is, what role has resettlement played in response to contemporary genocide? And maybe you can share US case. Oh, yeah, oh, it, it, microphones. <laughs> I know you would think I could handle this. Um, so I do want to step back a little bit because I've been throwing around this term a little casually, refugee resettlement, and what does that really mean? And as I intimated when I finished speaking before, what we talk about, what the work that Hyas does, came directly out of what happened in World War II. So after World War, World War II, there were obviously millions obviously, millions of displaced people across Europe. And it was incumbent upon the new United Nations, this brand new entity, to not only assist with finding durable solutions for these people, including through resettlement to other countries, including the US, but also to help form a better system to help protect refugees in the future. So what came out of that is what we call the 1951 Refugee Convention, 
and it's 1967 protocol. And I'm not gonna get too wonky and too in the weeds about this, but these are important documents because the US signed on to this, as did more than 100 other countries, and it provides the backbone of the international refugee protection system and came into existence as a direct result of genocide. At the convention's core is the principle that nobody should be forcibly forced to return to a country in which they would find themselves in danger or face persecution again, life-threatening danger. This is a principle that forms the foundations of US refugee and asylum law. The 1951 convention and its protocol and our US refugee law all have deep roots connecting them to the international recognition that the global community really failed to save those who were in World War II who experienced the Holocaust and that the world has to do better moving forward to protect forcibly displaced people during subsequent crises. Um, so that brings us to today into 2023. So while many people at this conference understandably are focusing on what is being done or not being done to prevent new genocides from taking place and to trying to stop current genocides because they continue as we speak, my particular focus is in fact on what we are doing to ensure that the people who have survived genocide and other mass atrocity events have access to safety and to peace and to permanent solutions. One way is through refugee resettlement. And so what does that mean? Refugee resettlement should come into play for people who cannot return to their home countries for any number of reasons, um, and they cannot successfully integrate into the countries to which they fled. Resettlement happens when the UN refugee agencies and governments like ours form an agreement to move people from one country, as Nira said, they initially went to Spain and then they came here. They're moved from their asylum country um, to a new place where they are guaranteed permanency. This is not a temporary thing. When you come through the US Refugee Resettlement Program, you are allowed to eventually get your green card and then five years later become a citizen. Durable is a key part of this. Now, as Nira said, less than 1%, 1% of refugees worldwide have access to resettlement. So a lot of the advocacy work that HIAS and other organizations like us do is to try to increase that number. And man, oh man, that is hard advocacy work. We really have not seen that needle move very much in many, many years. Not surprisingly, the number of people around the world who need to be resettled is going to continue to grow. As Nira said, you know, the, we are in the worst forced displacement crisis in recorded history. We're not talking about just since the end of World War II. We're talking about since people put pen to paper. It just keeps growing exponentially by the day. One out of every 77 people in the world is forcibly displaced. Think about what that means. One out of every 77 people. This is not a small little situation. This is the state of the world today. Um, and so as these numbers continue to balloon, marking more global displacement than any time before, we see two deeply problematic and um, significant trends. One is the inability of governments to stop these situations from taking place either in the first place or to stop them once they have started to address the root causes. So that means that more and more people are fleeing and fewer and fewer are able to go home. And two, states, including the United States, are starting to impose increasingly harsh immigration restrictions um, you know, and making it increasingly difficult for people who are in true need of safety to find it. Now, obviously, there are signs of hope. There are signs of, of that we should not all despair. For example, European countries really have stepped up to welcome Ukrainians. The US has stepped up to welcome Ukrainians. We stepped up to welcome Afghans. There are examples to show us that when there is political will to do this, it can be done. The issue is, where is the political will? Because it is only happening for very small numbers of people during very specific contexts. So we have a lot of work to do to get back to a place of being a leader in global resettlement. And I'm gonna give you some, what I find to be pretty stark numbers. This year, 
the U.S. government, the Biden administration said, we aim to resettle 125,000 people, which is also, by the way, a pretty small number given our capacity and local communities' interest in welcoming and the global need. Thus far this year, we have resettled 18,000. So you tell me how we're doing, right? And it should be noted, of course, that we could have been doing better. And I, I should say, as my comments might sound a little bit different, HIAS is a nonpartisan organization. I'm just sharing the cold hard facts. The cold hard fact is that the previous administration really was intent on obliterating our refugee resettlement program. And it is a lot harder to build something up than it is to wreck it. So we are still trying to come back from really hanging on by a thread to being back to a system that can really absorb larger numbers of people. We are making progress, we are. And tomorrow when the Assistant Secretary Noyce speaks about this, I'm sure she'll touch on this, we are seeing progress, but it is painfully slow when the needs, when the needs are so great. And I should also say, you know, I talk about the U.S. being a global refugee resettlement leader, or having been, and getting back to that place, but we also have a really checkered history, right? You know, we talk about this country being a country of welcome, but there are some really stark reminders that that is not always the case. There are always ebbs and flows to how resettlement works in this country. We are coming up, some of you might know this, we are coming up on the anniversary of when the St. Louis a boat that was carrying almost 1,000, actually a little more than 1,000 Jews who were trying to flee World War II, came to the US, came to Canada, and we did not let them in. They were sent back, and then several hundred of them died in the Holocaust. Now, I don't wanna you know, be too hyperbolic and, you know, we, and you know, try to draw too direct of a line between that kind of policy and let's say what's happening with our resettlement program now or our asylum system. But the point is that we, we can do better. We have not always risen to the reputation that I think some of us think that we have, and a lot of work continues to be done. But we also have not totally dropped the ball. There are, again, reasons that the US should be proud. We have resettled genocide, genocide survivors. Like my friend that I made at that camp, we resettled 150,000 Cambodians after Pol Pot's regime. We resettled several thousand from Rwanda. We resettled more than 130,000 from Bosnia. We have resettled Yazidi refugees. And we are now starting to resettle more and more Rohingya refugees. And as I said when I started, that is the issue that got me interested in this work. Right? So as other countries pay attention to what we're doing, it is really important to show that we are stepping up through resettlement to help survivors of genocide. So while we are making progress with Rohingya resettlement, I don't think anybody would tell you, could look you in the eyes and say, we are doing the best that we can do. And I'm gonna explain a little bit about why that is and why why we have to do better, speaking of contemporary genocide as this continues to take place. So we just started this year to resettle Rohingya refugees from Bang Bangladesh, where more than one million of them are. And about 700,000 of them fled in 20, 2017 um, because of what the UN, the United States, and other countries have declared to be a genocide, joining 300,000 others who had been there for decades. So Bangladesh, the government of Bangladesh, has been very trepidatious about allowing wide-scale resettlement because they are afraid of what is known as a pull factor. If we start to resettle large numbers from Bangladesh, that's going to be assigned to others go to Bangladesh and you can end up in the United States or Australia. But many of us find that to be faulty logic because as was said, nobody wants to leave their homes. I've been to those camps in Bangladesh and if you ask any single one of those people, they would tell you, I don't wanna be here, I wanna be home. I wanna get home as soon as I can, but they can't go home. They couldn't go home before the coup and they certainly can't go home now. So the US, I give our government an extraordinary amount of credit, has been keeping up the pressure, has been keeping up the pressure, and now finally we are starting to resettle from Bangladesh. 
very small numbers and there's a lot of advocacy to be done to make sure that those numbers pick up and that other resettlement countries do the same. Because if we don't, what we are saying to the world is, to Southeast Asia, this is really your problem. We said never again, but just kidding. This is something you get to deal with and we'll sit here and not do anything. And so it is really important that the global community steps up on this and we are starting to see trickles, trickles of hope there. So, um, so this, as I said, this is in the early days of the process and HIAS and other organizations, we wanna continue to pressure governments in the region and around the world to be very clear. What are your numeric goals to resettle Rohingya refugees? How out of a million people will you identify who is in need of resettlement? Who is the most vulnerable? Who has to come? We need to figure that out. But what the re Rohingya resettlement experience really shows us is the need for ongoing advocacy about the importance of resettlement writ large. Because my goodness, if we can't even do it for genocide survivors, you know, what, what leg do we have to stand on? So even though resettlement is meant to be a purely humanitarian response, one devoid of politics, that's just quite simply not the case. Um, resettlement priorities change in the United States from administration to administration. Support for resettlement comes and goes. Strategic imperatives change, you know, by the day, by the year. So this is where we come in as a community of concerned individuals to keep up the drumbeat, to be advocates. Um, and I will conclude my remarks by saying that coming from a community that I think would look very different were it not for resettlement, um, highest and organizations like mine has a special obligation, I think, to do advocacy around contemporary genocide and the role of refugee resettlement for Rohingya, for Uyghurs, wherever this happens again, because it will happen again. And resettlement is never meant to be the sole solution to a forced displacement crisis, never. We are not suggesting that somebody goes in and clears out the camps in Bangladesh and brings everybody here. That's not what resettlement is for, but it does need to be used more and more effectively and more strategically. So after I get off of my soapbox, I cannot go back to highest without I would get in deep trouble if I did not tell you how you can help to get involved. You should go to, you should go to our website, check out highest.org, and there's a big flashy button that says how to help. And there you can learn about how to do advocacy with us. You can learn about how to participate in our educational programs. You can learn about how to donate. Um, but it's really important. We want to see more and more and more of you engaged with this work because um, it is only continuing to grow, unfortunately. We would like to be put out of business, but um, as more and more people are displaced every day, the work becomes more and more urgent. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to the question and answer period. Thank you, Naomi. Yes, yeah, so, um, that was really um, a good um, information that you gave us, and you provided us with, uh, studying with some legal uh, protocols that um, we need to remember. We need to know that there is a um, legal background for what we are doing and what we are not doing, and how to hold these people accountable. So thank you for sharing this information. And yeah, when you were talking, uh, when, when you shared your uh, perspective, so I also jotted down some ideas uh, for myself and thank you very much for your last comment about how we all can um, help how we all can unite in order to help those people and really um speaking of refugees minimum two speakers are refugees here right uh and before uh, we started our panel um Naomi asked me about my status if i'm safe here and my status is so uncertain i'm here under temporary protective status which is not asylum seeker i'm not a refugee uh i don't have visa I, I stay legally here, no worries. <laughs> I, I have my work permit, I have my le uh, legal status until October 2023, but we don't know what will happen next, which uh, causes me a lot of anxiety. Every day I think about that. So what, what will happen to me and to my husband when uh, October 2023 comes, which is, you know, time flies so quickly, which is very soon. So what are we going to do? What if uh, U.S. government says that we do not prolong your status? So 
what, what, what are we supposed to do? We have nowhere to come back because our city is now under Russian control. Ukraine is a dangerous place um, to come back. Um, every day we have some um, attacks and missiles and uh, uh, everything and anything can happen. So um, that's why uh, what the uh, ex-president government uh, uh, was doing towards uh, and what the policy we had here towards refugees definitely is not uh, a supportive and welcoming environment for refugees. And now the current pres president's um, administration is, I think, they're doing a lot to support the refugees and to recover from that period. Yeah, that we had uh, four years, f four or five years ago, and uh, I also faced this situation when we applied for our even it's not a, a green card it's not um, visa status it's temporary protective status we applied our documents and we had to wait for five months five ish months even more so in order to have an answer and every day we were checking our statuses we were checking our mails and emails in order to understand what our situation was because we were not sure so uh, what are our uh, prospects and we may see that a lot has to be done. Um, a lot uh, uh, needs to be uh, reconsidered and um, how we need to help uh, these people. Of course, it's uh, it's a long process uh, recovering after previous administration. Yes, and if you ask me if I want to be in the United States, you know, it's American dream. A lot of people want to be here. A lot of people are dreaming to migrate to the United States. But as soon as you forcibly come here or stay here, um, you think, uh, what's next? Is it really a dream? <laughs> How I can accommodate myself? What I'm going to do here? So is it really my country? So that's why uh, sometimes people dream about um, another stay in another state living in another country, but when they actually have this opportunity and chance, again, not because they um, came here as a tourist, but because they had to stay here uh, because of the um, uh, conflicts or wars in their country. So the situation changes and we um, perceive ourselves and we feel uh, absolutely in a different way. So this is a great question. If we really want to stay here, which I want, I absolutely enjoy that. <laughs> okay, and my next question uh, will be to our next panelist, so Nera. Um, I would uh, like to ask you about authentic engagement in advocacy, grassroots organizing, and investment in refugee leadership and survivors of genocide. So if you could elaborate on that, and for our audience, we will have Q&A session after that, okay? So if you have some questions, so please um, give them. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say while you're speaking, Naomi, I was just riling me up, you know, because because everything you're saying is so true, and um, I think you really set the tone. Um, and before I really answer the question around the authentic engagement, I just want to elaborate a little bit more of the difficulty that it's been, as Naomi pointed out, in doing advocacy work, particularly I would say in the last five to seven years. And I've been doing this work close to 10 years now, but I, what we've really seen is some trends that are really concerning as far as the anti-refugee, anti-immigrant sentiment the last five to seven years. We've really seen a rise in xenophobia, Islamophobia, and, and um, you know, in the last administration, it was a complete dismantling of the U.S. refugee resettlement program, where many of us advocates wondered if the program was going to be around at all. And, and especially even uh, the asylum system, it, it's been completely, you know, it, it's been very, very difficult work. Um, Naomi shared, even though now we're in a different uh, place with a new administration, with a different administration, we're still only receiving, I think you said it, Naomi, about 18,000 refugees right now. So, um, and as Elena pointed out, she she's concerned every day around her status because even those who are, those who arrive through the Afghanistan evacuation or the Ukraine or through uh, sponsor, sponsorship program or through Ukraine, uh, many of them are here on a temporary status and must apply through asylum or other means to stay here, or they have they're going to be undocumented and must leave the country after a certain period of time. So I just want to kind of set the tone. This is the environment us advocates have been working with. And, and Naomi knows this really well because we both work in a national space. But 
Um, I, I think a big part of this is also uh, what's been driving a lot of this narrative is the media. Um, and, and I want to speak a little bit, also touch on the on what's portrayed as a border crisis as well. And really what we're seeing, the reason we're seeing things play out that they, the, the way they are is because legal pathways, particularly in the United States, are slowly diminishing and becoming non-existent. And many asylum seekers, for example, are being told to go to a U.S. port of entry and seek asylum. And so I know Tim had, had quoted um, a couple of statistics on top hosting countries, but I, I'm going to um, provide more recent statistics from 2022. The top hosting countries are not, the United States is not on that top hosting list, but it's Turkey who just experienced a massive earthquake that left the country shattered, um, Colombia, Germany, Pakistan and Uganda, those are the top hosting countries right now for refugees. And so whether we like to hear it or not, the U.S. in the in, in throughout decades, they, the U.S. has played a role in the global displacement. Um, and, and many times what we see because of political relationships between powerful Western nations and organizations such as the United Nations, there are still many atrocities and genocides that are happening that are not recognized. And that's just the reality of it. And that's causing a higher number of forcibly displaced individuals. And so while we have governments that are not stepping up, oftentimes during, especially right now, during this largest humanitarian crisis we're seeing, we don't really recognize the contributions the refugees and immigrants bring to our countries and, and to our local communities. And um, according to a, the New American Economy Report, which was a report that was published in 2015, there are over 181,000 refugee entrepreneurs that generated over $4.6 billion into the U.S. economy because many refugees and immigrants are known to own be, be business owners and entrepreneurs. They also fill in critical jobs such as hospitality. <clears throat> when you go and stay in a hotel, you see oftentimes, you know, refugee and immigrants are, are, are cleaning those rooms, the health sector, agriculture and manufacturing, and many of them played a very critical role even during the pandemic. We saw, I had many colleagues, several colleagues who were um, doctors back home and were asked to step in uh, to the line of work during the pandemic. And once they weren't no longer needed, their licenses were revoked. And now they have to go through the whole process of medical school in the United States because of accreditation. So we're still seeing this. Um, and, and also I wanna touch on how much refugee and immigrants bring cultural diversity into our communities. How many ethnic restaurants just here in the Phoenix metropolitan area are there that are owned by refugees, former refugees? And they truly help build more of a welcoming um, infrastructure and communities. So while we've been kind of seeing this trend of anti-immigrant, anti-refugee sentiment, and the lack of contribution, of rec recognition of contributions, this is exactly why we launched um, the, a national grassroots refugee advocacy campaign called the We Are All American National Campaign, where we really try to focus on centering people with forcibly displaced lived experience um, in our work. And our work focuses around advocacy, policy, and civic engagement. Currently, we are present in over 21 states with our steering committee partners and all of our staff are individuals with forcibly disp displaced backgrounds because we truly believe that those are the people that need to be helping doing advocacy as well. Now, one of the core pillars of our work is engaging them, as I mentioned, in advocacy. This is why we created a national refugee and immigrant table that really includes um, people with lived experience in shaping local, national, and international policy and dialogue around these matters that really impact us. We also provide a lot of training to in individuals with lived experience on how to do advocacy work, how to advocate for themselves 
and organize their own communities. We have a lot of ethnic community-based organizations who really help bridge the gap um, to helping their own ethnic communities. We help in, in coaching and training around sharing testimonies and effective storytelling and how to drive policy as well at the local or national level. And we truly see ourselves, as I mentioned at the beginning, we aren't, I don't see myself as a victim. We don't see ourselves as victims, but res resilient individuals who are perfectly capable of contributing to our new communities. And oftentimes I've experienced this and, and just speaking firsthand, oftentimes our voices are tokenized and we really need authentic engagement from the media, from our community partners, and also funders to step up and fund work for directly impacted individuals. The second area that I wanna kind of mention around um, authentic engagement and advocacy that we do is state and local policy work and really building a welcoming infrastructure in these local communities. We want to ensure we are pushing more welcoming and inclusive communities and policies here in the United States and provide people an opportunity to integrate and have access to resources. So for example, some of the work that we've been doing is we have our, um, our organizer in the state of Tennessee and last year, they were um, successful at passing a workforce development licensing bill in, in Tennessee. Here in Arizona, we secured $3 million in housing funding for refugees and immigrants so they could pay their, their rent and utilities. And we also worked support, uh, supported in, in passing in-state tuition here. So refugee and immigrant communities don't have to pay out-of-state um, tuition money because it's very costly. I'm sure as many of you who are students know. And so it's important to build that, establish that welcoming infrastructure and, and for, for our newcomers, um, our new neighbors. And then finally, I want to mention also more of a national landscape, which Naomi and I kind of work more in, but we, we really strive around working towards advocating for federal legislation. And these are different types of pieces of legislation that you know we're, we're advocating for, such as the Afghan Adjustment Act for people to have permanent status um, in this country from Afghanistan who arrived um, and other pieces of legislation. So that's one piece of our work and, and where we really engage people from the refugee and immigrant community to be part of these meetings with members of Congress to share their stories, to really be present in, in these um, uh, federal spaces. Um, and then finally, I'll mention that um, the narrative work and the rapid response that we've continued to do and the rapid response, it seems like it never ends. It, it's always um, happening. But one example I can give around rapid response is here locally. We had about a year and a half ago, armed protesters who showed up armed with guns and, and weapons um, threatening recently arrived Afghan families and children who were walking to school and who were being temporarily housed in one of the local hotels here. And this was actually, this protest was organized by a local elected official here in Arizona. So we had to do rapid response and work with the media to fight this rhetoric um, and ensure the safety of these families because their safety was now jeopardized after they've gone through something already so traumatic and they're just trying to start a new life and integrate here. So I just wanna point out like the, the importance that the, the tremendous power that the media has and the narrative that they put out and particularly with refugee and immigrants, um, sometimes they can provide misinformation or sometimes they could be really helpful to the cause and they can help influence world leaders, governments, politicians, and different entities such as the United Nations to really take action. And there is a need really to do work with the media and that, that's part of some of the work that we do as refugee advocates is we do a lot of uh, media education where we educate journalists around the facts of refugee resettlement, a lot of the facts that Naomi today mentioned. And so that's kind of a big summary of um, some of the work that we're doing when it comes to 
um, engagement of refugee um, refugee and immigrant leaders uh, and grassroots organizing and really the investment of refugee leadership. And I, I think just to close out, I, I really want to, um, you know, have a call to action to all of you in this room just to get involved. Um, you know, get involved with our campaign. We're, our website is weareallus.org or get involved and volunteer at a resettlement agency like HIAS or um, another refugee serving organization in your local communities. So I hope to see you all get more involved and we welcome you to become an ally and advocate with us. Thank you and back to you, Elena. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nera. So I love that we have different perspectives. So we have different stories and ways how we can support because it's really crucial that we work together in order to help um, those who in need and those who really need this support. And uh, yes, yeah, so speaking of uh, uh, different uh, opportunities that uh, this international uh, people come to uh, bring to United States, I would say that really we have diverse cultural environment here in the United States and uh, we have different businesses that bring their perspectives. We have different scholars who work uh, uh, all around the place with their minds, with their mindsets. So I think here we are so lucky that we have those people from different countries from around the world. Okay, now we. I would love to start the cure session. Okay, yeah. and uh, team, please. Yeah, we got several minutes for Q and A, and uh, yeah, I want to um, the call to action, right? because this is a true crisis and uh, people are closing borders when they should be opening it. I know the fantastic work that Nita's doing around here um, and I've seen it firsthand and just wanna put in a, a plug with that and Naomi as well. I'd be remiss if I didn't put in the plug for Hias as well. Um, but uh, so after these powerful presentations and words and uh, just, you know, this is where sometimes academia can be an obscurity. This is real life and um, this is what makes us so powerful. So uh, any questions or comments that people would like to? Hi, I admire your work and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I have a question. We all live, I live in Tempe here. Uh, and I'm curious to know where is the nearest international organization or the uh, refugee relocation agency where where would the local one be closest to Mirabella I believe so I'm definitely in a highest silo but I believe that the International Rescue Committee is is fairly close I think I'm gonna say this and then the next second I'm gonna double check on my phone so before you walk out I'll correct myself if I'm wrong I believe they have an office in Phoenix, um, and there there could be others, but certainly the IRC is right here. As I said, Hyas is in Tucson, so that's not super helpful. But um, in terms of direct volunteering opportunities, I think your closest bet is the IRC in Phoenix, and I'm gonna check to make sure I didn't just lead you astray. There is one in Phoenix. Actually, I can, I can answer that as well. So, please. Local people, so, please. Here in Arizona, there are four resettlement agencies and five now with highest. So uh, as mentioned, the IRC is in Phoenix, Northern Phoenix and Tucson office. There is Lutheran Social Services who uh, is off the 10 in uh, 32nd Street, 24th Street. Um, and they're also in Tucson. There is Catholic Charities, which is in downtown Phoenix. Also, they have a Tucson office. And there is one small organization called Arizona Refugee Immigrant Services who is in, in um, the Glendale area. Um, I also wanna mention two other amazing organizations that do um, the take donations and uh, furnishing, apartment furnishing for recently arrived families, um, the Welcome to America Project and um, Gathering Humanities. And they're all here locally. Both of those are here in Tempe. Yes, and Nita also had a oh, fantastic okay. event in uh, for Afghani women here in Tempe at the uh, at the public library. So there there are things and uh, get in touch with the organizations and um, yes, one of our panelists with all the even great logistical and the address addresses were very helpful. But uh, you know, again, we are all America. If you get in touch with Nita, she can 
definitely, um, they put on events as well. Thank you. Uh, what are the essential elements that you feel help children and families to adjust most easily to their new environment? Mera, you would like to take it? So the question is, what are the essential, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch for something for children. Yeah, essential elements of how we can help families and children to integrate in the local communities. What are exact, uh, yeah, what, what steps would be the most helpful? What approaches should we use? Yeah, how to adjust them into local communities in the easiest way. You know, I think for speaking from personal experience, uh, what was really helpful for my family and I, even for me as, as a child, is um, even having a welcoming, friendly neighbor, you know, who greeted us, welcomed us, took us around the city, took us to their temple, um, truly, you know, just opened us with welcoming arms and, and um, for them to be complete stranger and, and help us as much as they did, it was truly, you know, helpful. I think with children, um, it, it's a very it's very unique because there's so many so many aspects of it. How much trauma they've experienced, how much uh, how much they know the language or not, and so the resettlement agencies do have you know a case management team who helps the children get them um, signed up for school. Um, but a lot of the resettlement agencies on their websites and the two organizations I mentioned, if you're wanting to get more involved and donate items specifically for children, for example, they're always looking for donations for, for children. So you can always look up on their website as well or volunteer directly with them and get more involved with the families and, and their children as well. Yeah, I could also add some uh, points here. So the process is really multifaceted and we really need to do a lot. So starting with just compassion and um, shaking hands, hug people and uh, have a friendly smile, which you guys have. We are, we, we are very happy. A lot of Ukrainians who come here say like, oh, everybody's so smiley. <laughs> yeah, so everybody's smiling at me. Yeah, so um, that, 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 that helps. And also, of course, uh, financial support, uh, um, it's it always uh, necessary. Um, how to integrate children into kindergartens, into uh, schools, into universities. Uh, uh, it's a language barrier. Of course, we can um, ensure that these kids understand the language, so probably provide them some free. It's important that it should be free because people sometimes don't have uh, any extra dollar to pay for classes, any free classes to uh, teach English, not only kids, but adults as well. Also, um, as a case manager or as a community leader, we need to go to schools and talk to uh, educators there because um, sometimes when these teenagers come to school, uh, they don't see a positive response. And probably this is their job also a teacher and educator at the school to talk to local students, how to welcome a new um, refu refuge, how to uh, organize some activities, welcoming party, whatever we can do. So in order to um, integrate this um, kid or teenager into environment. So from financial, uh, I mean, uh, probably from a moral and supportive environment to uh, financial support. I just two very mundane, quick questions. How do you spell Hyas? I want to be sure to use the mic so we all hear. It's H I A S. Okay, H I A S. Thank you. Yeah. And then sales at Mirabella should know these two organizations that accept, that are looking for furniture and those things because people move here from large houses and do not know where to give their furniture. So if we could make sure that our sales department knows that, that would be great. Yeah, Anita, if you want to pass on anything that I can pass on to people at the conference as well or, you know, through our networks at ASU to, to help with that. Uh, Kate, did you have a quick question? Oh, I don't care. We can go a couple minutes over if there's uh, – we can do an extra question. If, yeah, this is an important panel, so. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for taking the opportunity to share um, all this really helpful information with us. 
Um, and I also realize there's a level of vulnerability with talking about the things that you've endured, so thank you for that as well. Um, so the question I had has to do with some of the challenges that women face in particular. Um, several of you have touched on or explicitly mentioned women who have been sexually assaulted, those who've been, um, who've been, who are uh, rape survivors. So I was just wondering what some of the challenges are that, that uh, some of the women face that you're working with who have, been, uh, who have been raped, and then also in some cases where those rapes have resulted in children, um, how you've uh, been able to, to meet some of those, those needs. Naomi, do you, do you want to talk about maybe like the survivors of torture programs that resettlement agencies have and, yeah, and you know, yeah. case management? Yeah, sure. So, so as, as Nira said, the resettlement agencies, so the way resettlement works is for the first three months, there's a very intense period of, of helping people get their feet on the ground, the kids in school, all the right paperwork, medical appointments, things like that. But then, of course, you know, you can't start a new life in three months. It's this much longer term process. So at the federal level, in the Department of Health and Human Services, there is what is known as the Office of Refugee Resettlement that provides additional funding for the organizations doing the work at the local level to help with exactly the type of, of situations that you talk about. So um, as Nira said, there is funding explicitly for survivors of torture. And um, there are organizations that really specialize in this. So when the resettlement agencies are sitting at the national level, we are all either located in Washington, D.C., or New York, or in Baltimore. But we have these networks around the country. We are aware of which of our local partners have a real expertise in this. So when we see the cases coming in and have clearly identified some of these issues, we are very thoughtful about placing them in communities that either have the resources at the local resettlement agencies or have access to resources in their communities. And so um, it's a very thoughtful, thoughtful process. And I just wanted to add to what everyone was saying in terms of the agencies here in the Phoenix area. This work would literally be impossible without community support, including for support for women who have been through the unspeakable and their children. We call it a public-private partnership because it is baked into the program that we have to have volunteer support. And so, especially if you are coming with a specific area of expertise, working with populations that have been through those types of circumstances, you should reach out to your local resettlement agency. There's it's going to be very hard for somebody to say no to having an offer of help from somebody who has a real level of expertise in these really important areas. Okay. Um, thank you. Could we uh, thank you, Elena, for uh, moderating Naomi, uh, Naomi and Nita. Uh, and again, you know, this is a panel and a session where, like, we can really get involved and. As Naomi said, this is growing exponentially. You know, Elena shared her uh, experience as a Ukrainian woman, as did uh, Nita with you know her story and her organization. Um, these organizations need support. These people need support, and like th this is a true crisis. It's beyond a crisis, actually. Like it's uh, so you know, please take up their calls for support and help and get involved and. We need to change policies. We need to support people. And once again, thank you again for your thank incredibly you. powerful thank you presentations. Much. Thank you, everyone in the audience.